Okay, so welcome everybody, uh, Deep Learning for Coders. We're covering week eight, uh, convolutional neural nets. Um, it, this was an interesting week in terms of like following along with the video, which is what I've been doing kind of up to this point versus, you know, sometimes looking at the book. Uh, it turns out that half of the video this week was really about what John was talking about last week, which was the um, the recommender system uh, topic. So <laughs> if you if you read, if you watch the video, forty five minutes were of, of that, and then the the last forty five minutes, maybe half hour were dedicated to uh, see uh, convnets, uh, and then maybe uh, another 10, 15 minutes of Jeremy given his uh, productivity and life hacks. <laughs> we can we can spend some time talking about that if you're you're interested, but. Um, I will focus primarily on the on the CNNs. Uh, before I dig deep into the the, the weeds here, um, just share my screen briefly. It, I'm thinking back to uh, my field, which is um, insurance. I'm an actuary. Um, this, there's a, a paper that's, that's kind of relevant to what I do. Um, I, I still need to really get into the, the detail with this, but essentially it's using convolutional neural nets um, in, a, in a regression style um, use case to predict healthcare costs, you know, using historical data, um, like visit information, diagnosis information, um, prior cost. And What's cool about this is, you know, typically you hear about uh, folks using recurrent neural nets uh, or these LSTM architectures, you know, when you're dealing with time series uh, for, for, for predicting or forecasting the future. But these authors used a convolutional neural net. So they've converted uh, everything to an image essentially. So you'd have like time on one dimension and then, um, you know, Pri pri historical cost features on another dimension or, or diagnosis information, uh, you know, on, on this this other uh, axis. If, you know, if you're you're making these two D images from this, and um, they used kind of that transfer learning approach we talked about in the very first after the first week, using ResNet, AlexNet, and some others, and then they developed their own custom ConvNet architecture, and apparently they're claiming that this outperforms uh, some other models that they built using like XGBoost, you know, which you would think would run really well with tabular style data, which, which this is, other than that they've converted it to um, an image. Um, I, again, I, I haven't implemented this myself. I, I really have been kind of putting this on my list to, to try out because I think it's, it's really cool. Um, and it's also something that Jeremy mentioned early on in the course, right, where folks were converting uh, things to images when you wouldn't maybe think to do that initially. Um, so, so um, yeah, so CNNs may, may work in my field uh, for, for predicting costs, which is something that uh, actuaries do quite often. So yeah, paper is about four years old now. Uh, yeah, so let's get into uh, week eight. Give me a second here to pull up my screen. Here we go. And uh, hopefully you can read this. The left hand side is, is really just my summary of what's, you know, of the chapter versus the right hand side, which is, is the fast book chapter. I, I think, you know, the, the chapter really was more important this week than the video itself. So I'll um I'll walk through my really high level summary and then maybe go through some of the diagrams from the book when we need to. Is this is this too confusing to have both up at the same time or does this work? Do I need to yes. blow things up? This is good. This is okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so interestingly enough, like the 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 short story of convolutions, convolutional layers, is that really what we're doing is applying feature engineering to the data. Um, it's done in an automated fashion, or we're learning uh, the the right filters to use in, in the in the convolutional uh, 
tra transformations, but but at, at the end of the day, it really is a form of feature engineering, taking a raw input, typically that's an, an image, uh, applying some, what, what are essentially matrix multiplies to that data um, so that you know you have a better representation for learning uh, potentially what's in that image. Um, and you know a lot of the, the chapter is talking about basic filters for learning things like edge detection, how we can really um, highlight the the top edge, a side edge, a diagonal edge. Um, and, and we focused a, a lot in this chapter on the MNIST data set. So we're looking at digits, right? And, you know, how can you apply a filter that uh, can really highlight, um, like, I, I don't know, the top edge of the number seven, for instance. Um, one of the, the benefits of using uh, convolutional layers, wh why we do that, uh, as opposed to just using dense layers, and, and Jeremy didn't really talk about this in the in the in the book, but you know, if you just read other literature on CNNs, uh, is that these convolutional layers are really good about local learning things locally as opposed to globally. Um, you, you know, if you're you're focused on one particular um, portion of an image, like the bottom right corner of an image, right? A convolutional neural net's good at finding that. And then also extrapolating. So if it sees another image that's not in the, the bottom right, it's on the top left. You know, the object of of, of interest is in the top left. In another image, it, it extrapolates pretty well there. Whereas with you know those dense layers that you, you kind of learn about when you're first learning about neural networks, aren't so good at, at local learning. It's better at global representations. Um, all right, and so. Uh, the, the way these CNNs work, you, you start with a kernel, typically. Uh, we call it a kernel, but it's really just a, a small matrix. And um, you know the, the, the canonical uh, example, I guess used a lot in practice now, is a three by three matrix, where we apply element-wise multiplication of that kernel matrix to a similar size portion of your input. And that could be the raw image or you know another layer and um, on the right hand side this is a, <clears throat> a, a, a i think a decent representation of, of what we're, we're talking about here so on the right in, in the red we would have our kernel it's three by three we have an image it's seven by seven and so uh you know you're, you're taking all of the individual components of the three by three kernel multiplying it each element wise to the a three by three section of your image and then adding those up kind of like a dot product operation but again we're, we're doing this element wise then then adding and then you get a, a single number there so it's really summarizing information from multiple pix pixels together into one figure collapsing it together into to one figure and um, I've summarized on the left some we can construct our own filters right explicitly as opposed to, to letting the the uh the the model learn its own filters which is what you do in practice but just for the the sake of of, of understanding this we can create a top edge detector here um as follows where you'd have a a row of negative ones in the top um a row of ones in the bottom and, and zeros in the middle and so typically w when you're looking at you know, a, a digit, I'm scrolling over to the right now, uh, again, sorry, I'm jumping back and forth, but, you know, you would see these these lighter pixels at the at the top, and then it would all of a sudden get get pretty dark. Um, and so um, this this top edge um, detector, you know, if you're, 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 you're placing this kernel somewhere in the middle here, you know, it would really uh, produce a high number, uh, potentially, if this, this you know, this row of ones hits up against, you know, this really dark set of rows here. Whereas, you know, if, if the, the middle row here is, is corresponding to, to, to this first row where we're seeing non-zero pixels, that would all get zeroed out. And then, you know, you're starting with zeros over here. And if you're multiplying that by negative ones, you know, that, that turns to, to, to all the zeros there. So um, again, this is a way to represent 
how you detect uh, the, the top edge. We could manipulate that matrix a bit where we have the negative, or sorry, the ones on top and the negative ones on the bottom, and that would be good at detecting bottom edges. And, you know, just continuing in this vein, we could, we could have a left edge detector. Um, so we were essentially transposing some of these matrices, um, you know, for, for detecting the, the horizontal edges, um, you know, a left edge, we'd have negative ones in, on the leftmost column, ones on the right, kind of switch the, the right and left columns to get a right edge detector. Um, and then in the book, there were a couple examples here of, of how to detect diagonal uh, portions as well. Um, and interestingly enough, I think in, in the book, and I, I could scroll through it and find it, but you know, on one of these, he, he didn't just do like a one a set of ones and then zeros and negative ones. He did like ones and then negative ones and then zeros. <laughs> and I, I played around with that a little bit using the kind of the, the fast book set up and, and and at this you still you still highlight the the edges either way wh whether or not you have a zero as your your middle row there but um this is this is just kind of a basic setup if, if you want to understand what what some of these filters are doing any questions at this point anybody str struggle with this concept or find it interesting have, have you worked with cnns in the past is this pretty pretty much brand new for for folks? This is kind of a review for me. Gotcha. Yeah, I think in the past, uh, Torin, you you mentioned you're pretty strong on theory, but haven't uh, yeah <laughs> ha haven't done a lot of uh, stuff in the wild. Yeah, I've right. yeah, done a lot of the by hand calculations from scratch before. Well, not a lot. Actually, I have one course that I did in grad school. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And as I've mentioned previously, I, I mostly work with tabular data. So I don't deal with neural nets a lot, and in particular, not, not uh, CNNs. i hoping that changes in the future. But um, all right. Let's continue uh, with the, the process of applying these kernels uh, across an image. And so, you know, as we mentioned, you're, you're kind of lining up a three by three kernel against a three by three section of your image. And, and typically you want to apply this kernel over the entire image. So on the right, this is trying to, to capture what, 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 what you're doing here is, you know, you, you start in the top left quadrant, apply your, your convolutional uh, operation, move over to the right one slot, do the same mathematical operation, kind of move over to the right again, do that same operation. And um, on the left here, I'm just highlighting a function that, that was in the book, basically doing that element-wise uh, multiplication, then summing things up. And then if you want to do this over the entire image or input space, um, you could, you know, if you're doing this manually, you, you could use this apply kernel function and then with a list comprehension, say, hey, hey, do this for, for every, you know, set of coordinates that, that, that spans my, my input space here, which, you know, maybe that raw image. And, you know, what happens is if, if you're using a three by three kernel, uh, going through this process, you know, where you're, you're applying that mathematical operation across the entire image, and let's say your your starting point is a 28 by 28 image, um, you end up with um, a, a, an output, a set of outputs that's actually smaller than 28 by 28. And so with with a three by three kernel, um, you know, against a, a square input, you, you basically are going to subtract off two pixels in your your final dimension. So from your you go from a 28 by 28 to a 26 by 26. And then the, the book goes into, well, hey, like you're not going to do this stuff by hand in, in practice. PyTorch does this work for you or for fast AI abstracts some of that even, even more so. Um, 
but you know, a point is made that within PyTorch, you can actually combine multiple filters together, stack them together. And so there's a torch dot stack operation. So you can have four, four different kernels in this case that we've created manually, right? Put them all together um, in, in one object. And then to get this thing to work within, um, within PyTorch, you need to apply this unsqueeze operation. I wasn't particularly familiar with this, but the idea is um, with PyTorch, you're, it, it really expects tensors of a certain size. And what this does is it, add, it adds an extra access, <laughs> access, excuse me, that, that you need for, for performing the operation. So just wanted to point out that little tidbit here. Um, and then there's a, a function com v2d um, where you can apply if you're manually applying a, a, a you know a, a specific kernel to your input space. This is the function that you would use to do that. Um, and that f and the f dot is I think comes from the fast AI library um, that is kind of abstracted on top of the the PyTorch library. All right. Um, and I'm scrolling to the right here. Just this is just visual depictions of, you know, obviously this this top image here is, is detecting uh, edges on the top. Looks like here we're we're picking up edges on the on the left. More more um, highlighting of of left edge. Okay. And now. There's this concept of padding out there that is, I guess, pretty common when you're setting up uh, CNNs these days. And, and so like we just talked about when you're doing the conv convolutional uh, operation, you, you lose dimensions, right? And one way to avoid that is to apply padding. Um, and, and there's an image on the right here that depicts what padding is doing. And a lot of times, you know, you're adding one or more pixels to the perimeter of your, your existing input, right? Which again, could be that raw image. Um, and that way, as you do this convolution operation across the entire image, you're, you're not really losing um, any dimensions as, as you go, go across there. Um, and then there, there was actually, there's like a, a form, formula out there um, so if your kernel is, you know, k by k, and three by three is normal, um, the extra padding that you would need around the perimeter of your input, so that you know you're not losing dimensions, is is you take that the, the raw dimension three in this case, right, and do inter, integer division uh, by two, right? So you take three by three divided by two. Um, you know, the floor there is, is one, it's right. It's, it's one, one and a half, but round that down when you're doing integer division. Um, so, so that would be the extra padding that you would need around your entire image. Does that make sense? Okay. And so then another, uh, concept that we learn about in this section is, uh, what, what's called st uh, strides. Um, and so we, we just talked about the process of moving across your image or input. Um, and, you know, in the, the first depiction here, we're, we're moving over one row at a, excuse me, one column over at a time from left to right, but we don't have to do that. We, we could actually, uh, move two columns over at a time instead of, instead of one. So that would be. I think that's called what is it a stride stride two convolution. If you're jumping over columns, you're you're moving, uh, sk skipping one column uh, at a time. And I guess that is um, stand the standard approach these days is to um, to use a stride two. And um, I'm going to pick on Torin. Um, you know, part of when you're using. Uh, stride two, your output space also decreases there. Um, I don't recall in the book or the the lecture of of why we want to do stride two and why that's preferred um, over just uh, a stride of one there. 
do you recall or does does anybody other than you are kind of reducing the dimensionality overall and sometimes that's preferable but um why do we do that now as as our standard operation well yeah, i don't know but um i think what i would guess is what you were saying about dimension reduction yeah. mm -hmm. um and then there is a formula out here as well on the left, basically that that will show you what the size of your um, output will look like with, a, with with depending on what your stride pace is. Um, you know, generally speaking, your output size, your dimensions will decrease by a factor of two, and because you're talking a two by two grid, your overall, you know, dimensions, your you know, squared right, uh, will decrease by a factor of four. Um, so, you know, there's some integer division going on here. So it's not a straight, you know, your dimensions decrease. It, it doesn't necessarily exactly half each time, but that's pretty much what's happening. You, you'll see some examples throughout the book there. Um, all right. Lots of topics here. And if it's um, your first time seeing some of this, it can be a bit overwhelming. I, I have gone through some of the uh, fast AI videos in the past and read portions of deep learning for Python. So it's not my first run at this rodeo, but again, this is not my day to day either. So lots of, lots of topics here. Um, you know, midway through the, uh, the chapter, there's this idea that like, Hey, if this makes it easier for you to understand, you can actually express the convolution operation as a matrix multiply. I don't know if that really <laughs> helped me at all. Maybe it helped other folks out here. On the right, this is trying to depict what's going on here. I, I think this image in particular shows you you can express, you know, moving across the entire image um, with these learnable filter uh, items that are depicted by these um, these Greek letters, right? Um, and if you set up a matrix in a particular way. Um, Again, those Greek letters are your learnable filter numbers. These A through Js are pixels in your your image. This can be expressed as as basically a, a matrix vector multiply. And then there's there's um, these bias coefficients that you should get added at the end. Um, there's there's some additional complexities here though, like the the alphas all have to equal the same value, right? Uh, these these you can't have like a, an alpha zero and an alpha one for instance Th these all have to be the same betas would all have to be the same and, and in this representation there are zeros as well um, and those aren't learnable things during training like those will always stay um, as as zero weights um, again that's that's mentioned here in the in the book um, I didn't again find this particularly helpful other than I don't know maybe matrix multiplication is less scary for folks so you, you can kind of convert this whole process as, as one matrix vector multiply. Yeah, and I don't know if this helps either, but um, so in sometimes like in spatial statistics or if you just have gridded data, like an mm -hmm. image and you wanna do tabular regression, you might have a feature that's like your neighbor to the left value top down, uh, right and so you can sort of think of those alpha beta gamma delta as the regression coefficients for the effect of your neighbor to the right left up and down that's really neat um and i'm not i'm certainly not well versed in that area and would you ever use convolutions for for doing some of that stuff or yeah people are yeah using cnn in spatial statistics quite a okay. bit now yeah. Um, yeah. Neat. Okay. I mean, I just make one observation. Sorry, I'm late coming in here. Yeah. Hey, Ron. Um, that the the re one of the things about looking at it as a matrix multiplication that makes you realize, hey, this is actually just like a dense layer, except it's highly constrained. Like a lot of things are constrained to be zero. Sometimes it's called mm -hmm. um, inductive bias, right? It's got some inductive bias. Mm -hmm. We think this has a certain structure to it. 
So it's a dense layer, but highly constrained. A lot of the variables are stuck to be the same. A lot of them are set to zero. So I think that was one of the insights I got from that section yeah. or somewhere. Maybe not from that section, but from somewhere. I mean, I would I would think from a computational standpoint, if you can set something up as a matrix or matrix vector multiplication, then that that's going to just run faster, more efficiently. So I don't know if under the hood, something like this is really happening or not. Um, but but right, I mean, computers are kind of yeah. particularly GPUs are designed to do matrix multiplies. So you but know, if your image is really big you'd have a really sparse matrix anyway. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I guess you could use sparse matrix methods. Yeah, I you know there's a, a lot of, a lot of <laughs> tricks under the hood for that stuff. That's like a whole nother course. <laughs> All right. Um, and then just moving on to like creating a, CNN from from scratch. Again, I'm, I'm kind of duplicating on the left and right here. I'm just doing the greatest hits on the left uh, for for Ron. If you <laughs> don't didn't catch capture this, I kind of summarizing stuff on the left. The right is the actual book. Um, but this is seems similar to TensorFlow. I, I'm not as familiar with um, PyTorch, where you can set up you know uh, a sequential model um, where you're defining, hey, here's my convolutional layer. You could put in a dense layer, throw in an activation in the form of a, a ray U, and then you know another convolutional layer here. So this is just, you know, I guess the syntax that's being used to instantiate this this type of model. Um, and then Jeremy advocates for creating your own custom functions because it, you know, reduces the likelihood that you're going to make an error. And so basically, he's just taking this concept above, but you know, automatically accounting for like the padding size that we want, automatically putting this this ReU uh, activation at the end of our convolutional neural net. So I thought that was kind of cool. And probably a good good practice, right? To reduce the the amount of code you're writing um, to make it clear clear to read. So create this custom function, um, fewer lines of code in total. Uh, yeah, and then. He shows this example. What what we often do um, with the stride length of two, you're essentially reducing the dimensions in half with each step. And he's showing that here. You know, it's not quite halved, um, right? Because you see, you're going from fourteen to seven, which is a half, but then seven goes to four, which right? It's not three and a half. It's <laughs> It's four, and then you know you have to to two, and then and then one. Um, I think I, I talk about this later, and and the book mentions, but a lot of times what you'll do is you'll introduce additional. I, I think there's there's different terms for it. There's filters, uh, channels, or features that all kind of mean the same thing, uh, be, because you are reducing dimension dimensionality overall. You want to combat offset that a bit by introducing more features uh, because in the later layers of your network, you know, you're learning really complex representations, just no longer learning just, hey, this is an edge, but you know, the, the later layers are learning things like, hey, this is an eyeball. And um, you, you don't want a simpler model there. So I, I think that's that's one of the reasons why you um you you want to increase the number of, of features here. And and that's what's being depicted here um, in this this uh, CNN. Hopefully that, that made sense. Any, any questions at this point? Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, one thing that always confuses me and I have is is the uh, the arithmetic. <laughs> behind like the number of parameters in each layer. I don't know if any of you folks have, have walked through this in the past. I'm guessing Torin, you have. Um, like I've done some Coursera courses on this before, but it's always confusing uh, to say the, the least. Um, and it's crazy when you look at it. And so like on the right here, you have output of how many parameters 
you have with, with each layer of your neural net. And, and you get similar output regardless if, if you're using fast AI or raw PyTorch or if you're using TensorFlow. Um, you know, these diagrams are pretty, pretty um, universal uh, across the different um, software out there. And um, like you'll see at the end of this first convolutional um, layer, you end up with 40 parameters. And so there's a question like, how do you arrive at 40 parameters? And it turns out that, well, we, we started with, I'm going to the left here. I think we started with one input channel. We had four output channels or we're generating these four features at, uh, at the end and we had a three by three kernel. So if you multiply that all, all together, um, nine by four, you get 36. And then each channel has its own bias. So that's four, right? So then you get 40 parameters at the end here. Um, so that's not so obvious if you're just kind of looking at this. Um, and then if you're going to this next layer here, um, you end up with 296 total parameters. And so again, just walking through the math, it's, you're just multiplying stuff together here. You, you we started with four features or channels. We ended with eight. And again, we applied this three by three kernel to it. Um, so you multiply all these figures together, you end up with 288. Um, but now we have eight channels at the end. Uh, so you have eight biases that you add. So then you end up with 296 total parameters. Um, I had to kind of carefully walk through that to, to really understand that. But it, it, it's, it's simple arithmetic. But at, at the end of the day, again, it, it, it's hard to... It's easy to get lost in the shuffle with with how these are generated. So, if you have um, a lot of time on your hands, you can keep going with all these different layers here. Um, yeah, and and then there was just commentary about the number of computations you're performing um, in the first layer. Uh, you start with you know we had a twenty eight by twenty eight image, but then it got reduced to fourteen by fourteen. Um, you multiply that together, you get 196 locations. Um, and then we had, let's see, in this next layer, if you're not including the biases, we had 296, subtracting out eight for the, for the biases that you're left with 288. Um, you know, you, you take 196 by 288, you have over 56,000 multiplications that are happening. And then in the next layer, we're starting with a seven by seven. So that's 49. And then we have these, you know, over 1100 uh, parameter weights, subtract out the, the biases. You do that multiplication together and you still have the same number of computations happening across layers. Um, and the justification there again is like, you don't want to reduce complexity as you move through the 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 network there because again you're learning higher uh more sophisticated representations so you 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 don't you don't want uh you know lower dimensions you want to keep things somewhat stable hopefully i've interpreted that correctly if anyone else had a, a different takeaway from from that section let me know but that's that's kind of what i'm i'm understanding here um and you know just in the wild you, you typically do see like the number of features coming out of each convolutional network doubling or channels, if you want to call them that, or filters. Um, and, and again, the stride length of two seems to be kind of the default assumption that folks tend to be making these days. So as long as you're doubling your features with, with each of these uh, convolutional layers, and then you're doing a stride length of two, you know, you're, you're kind of keeping things somewhat stable from a computational standpoint. All right. And moving on, uh, this was just a hodgepodge of different, I don't know, engineering principles, if you will, uh, if you're having trouble with with maybe long training times or poor accuracy. Um, one thing you see people do sometimes is uh, increasing your kernel uh, in that first layer. So, it, you know, it's common to use a three by three kernel, but Sometimes, um, you know, we, we might want to start with something larger. Uh, in the book, they, they, they tweaked 
the, the starting layer by, by making that kernel a five by five. Um, and my understanding is that by doing so, you can reduce the risk of overfitting. Um, I can't, can't say I fully understand. I'm still digesting kind of the example, but they talk about, um, you know, you're using uh, a three by three filter. So there's nine components there. And then, you know, you might have eight filters uh, along with that three by three. Um, so at the end of the day, you're using nine pixels to produce eight filters is kind of the takeaway. Again, I'm probably not explaining that um, eloquently, but, you know, that, that sure sounds like overfitting. It's kind of like in a basic regression problem, if you had three data points and you wanted to fit a quadratic equation to it, like you're, you're going to overfit. That's, that's overkill. And I think the same principle applies here, why you might not want to start with, um, you know, a three by three kernel and you start with something larger. Uh, another thing that was mentioned when you're building your neural net layer, I'm scrolling down here so we can get a visual depiction. Of, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, activation stats. And I don't know if this was a PyTorch or fast AI specific item, but as you're training, you can get a visual representation of your activations, kind of what they look like as you're training across uh, epochs. And, and so what you're looking for are either static, you know, mean standard deviations, or at least a smooth curve and not like a lot of fluctuation. Um, and you don't want to see a lot of your activations hovering around zero. Um, that can be problematic in terms of training time. It can be problematic in terms of the yeah, accuracy of your model. So this was just kind of a tool tip. If you're developing, you might want to look at these stats. This is a way to, to find um, problems in your model. And so this, this first set of um, plots here is, is the, the, an initial layer. Um, so we do see a, like a lot of bouncing around in the mean here early on and the standard deviation. Not so many uh, activations uh, at zero, but it is creeping up. And then we're looking at a later layer in our network and we're seeing just this crazy drop off, right? In the mean and the standard deviation. And then almost all of our activations are close to zero. And that is uh, bad news and a sign that maybe you want to uh, mix things up a little bit, try different things. And one of the things they mentioned, right, if you're you're kind of struggling with this problem above or just with accuracy or training time is uh, increasing the batch size. I, I think that the default examples in the books were using a, like a, a mini batch of, of 64 images at a time. Um, one thing you could do is you could bump that up to, to 512, for instance. And um, one of the, the, the pros that was mentioned in doing this is you get more accurate gradients when you're doing that. Uh, gradient descent calculation, um, but then you have fewer batches for, for each epoch, right? Because you're training more images at a, at a time. So you're not updating your, your weights as often. So that's seen as a, a negative. So there's, you know, good with the bad there. But this is just one thing mentioned as like, hey, if you're getting poor results, try increasing your batch size. That, that may help. Um, and I think in this case, they did the the uh, increase the the batch size and you're still getting some some funky stuff going on here, a lot of activations that are are pretty close to to zero. All right, uh, yet another tool in our toolkit, uh, if you're struggling, is uh, what's called one cycle training. And this was really interesting. Um, and I think we've used this in an earlier lesson. There's this uh, fit one cycle that's built into fast AI. And, and I think it was the very first lesson where they, they employed this. And the idea is um, uh, you, you don't necessarily want to use, first of all, you don't want to necessarily use one, one learning rate the entire time you're training. Um, and so 
this, the, this one cycle training is based on a paper released in 2015. It's apparently by the same person that uh, developed this loss ratio finder function that's also built in the fast AI. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Um, but the idea here is you start with a, a pretty low learning rate initially as you're warming up. And then you, you um, for the bulk of your training, you ramp up to a pretty high learning rate, higher than what maybe um, folks often use, um, you know, in practical applications, and then slow back down again uh, towards the end here. Um, and the idea, I, I think the the big the big win from this approach is that uh, training time can be sped up drastically. Um, and then also accuracy is um, sometimes improved as well. Uh, so that's one thing that you can do. And scrolling down here, uh, I think this is output after applying that um, one cycle. And things are still looking a little little funky here, but maybe not quite as funky as before. At least the percentage of activations near zero. They're still high, but it's not like close to 100%. It's more like 80% that we were seeing before. Um, and then we can talk at this at the end. There's there's something that was called color dim. I, I really, I skimmed over this. This was developed by someone, a student at Fast AI. Um, yeah, let's just <laughs> skip over this for now, but it's based on the normal distribution. I, I think the idea is you want to have... Um, kind of a quadratic looking shape here because you're taking the log of a normal equation, which should be quadratic in shape. And um, yeah, that, that's a tool that I, I really just glossed over. Um, if anyone wants to enlighten me, we can, we can do so, but I'm going to skip over that for now because there's just a lot of material in this chapter and talk about batch normalization. Uh, that apparently is um, something that's pretty standard um, in, in neural nets these days. Um, and you can apply this at various places um, in your training, right? Like after a, after a convolutional layer. Um, what that does is it takes your raw, it could take raw inputs or your raw activations. Um, I believe you can apply this before you're doing like the, the Rayu or, or after. Um, but it takes the raw input and um, normalizes it similar to like a z-score where you're subtracting out the, the means of the activations and dividing by the standard deviation so you get a normalized value as opposed to to the, these raw values and then there's an additional manipulation that's typically applied to which looks like a, a linear tweak where you have a, a normalized value we're going to call that y and then you learn these two additional parameters gamma which is like a um, the slope coefficient right and then a beta uh, parameter, which looks like an intercept and a regression, um, uh, which which I guess uh, is pretty standard as well if you're going to apply the, this batch normalization technique. Um, again, it's one of these engineering type principles. I, I don't know how much um, theory there is underlying this other than one of the main motivations for applying batch normalization originally was that there, there's something called covariate shift where your distribution of your inputs can change over time as you're training. Um, there's there's a whole paper uh, related to that that is cited in the book. I, I didn't check it out, but um, suffice it to say that batch normalization is a pretty common thing uh, that folks do to their neural nets. And I don't think that's necessarily restricted to uh, just convolutional, like, you know, computer vision type problems, um, you know, it addresses the slow training issue so, uh, sometimes, and it, it and also if you're getting poor, poor results in the form of you know low accuracy or whatever your metric is, you know R squared or root mean squared error, et cetera. If you're getting poor results, this is something that's uh, worth trying. And and again, if you're seeing a lot of those activations near zero, this, this is something that can be a, a bit of a godsend there and address that issue as well. Um, it, it, another thing that you, Folks mentioned, you know, as a, a reason for using batch normalization is that it, it can combat overfitting. Um, this was left out of the, the chapter, uh, but was mentioned in the video dropout, which is another common technique. And it's in some respects doing, you know, also trying to tackle that idea of, of overfitting. 
Um, and so like, if you're just dealing with like a, a dense, a fully connected um, neural net, you could randomly remove some of those connections, right? And that would be like dropout applied to a fully connected layer as a way to combat overfitting. And so a similar principle happens with like the convolutional operation, right? Like once you ap apply a convolution to an image, you still get another image on the back end. It just might highlight edges, for instance. And so if you apply um, dropout to the, the um, transformed uh, image, right? You're just going to get like a lot of zeroed out pixels and it still may resemble an image. It's just corrupted a little bit uh, or transformed. And so doing so combats overfitting, you may end up with a more generalizable result uh, because you're, you're um, applying that, that, that process. And so I don't know if it's recommended to do like both batch normalization and dropout. I, I know those are two common tools that you see out in the wild, but um, you should probably know, know both of those two to a degree. Um, yeah, and then I'll just kind of wrap up by things that were mentioned in the video that weren't addressed um, in the book at all. Um, when you're doing these these convnets, I, I guess one thing you typically see now is um, average pulling um, at the end where you're, you have, um, I don't know if it, you don't necessarily have a one by one final output, but maybe it's like a seven by seven or something like that. And the, the, the pulling would actually just take the average of, of um, you know, the, the seven activations potentially that you have at the end. And um, I, I guess that it tends to be more common today than, than something that was more common just a few years ago, which was called max pulling, you know, where, where if you have a grid, you may take just the max activation of a, of a certain grid size. Um, so, you know, check out the video if you haven't for, for more details on that. Again, it wasn't really emphasized in the chapter itself. Um, but um, again, I understand pulling is, is pretty common also in computer vision problems. So if you're building these things from scratch, you're probably going to have these convnet layers. Um, you, you're going to have, you know, these ReU, uh, rel, ReLU um, activation layers. You may have some dense layers at the end, a pulling layer, um, uh, and uh, potentially dropout and, uh, and batch normalization along the way. These are all different uh, tools or methods that, that you typically see in the, uh, in the architectures that, that kind of win the day that you, as your final model. You, you just you kind of need to know about all these things to a, to a degree there. So uh, yeah, we're pretty close to the hour here. That was a lot of material. Um, you know, we can talk about Jeremy's productivity hacks <laughs> if you want, like eating a well-balanced diet and getting enough sleep. And um, it was interesting. Uh, Jeremy mentions he spends half of his day just learning something new. <laughs> I wish um, I had that, that luxury uh, as well. I, I typically find that like six hours of my day are spent in meetings. So I, I, I can't really <laughs> devote half of it to, uh, to learning something new, but um, it's a great thing to do if you can, you can swing it. I didn't listen to that part of the video because <laughs> I watched both of them seven and eight yesterday. So I just thought. <laughs> yeah, it, it was definitely, definitely a lot. Um, I mean, I think he, he has some really good recommendations out there. Um, right. Like he's promoting the book that his, um, one of the, his partners in, in writing the book. He, he, I think that was mentioned early yeah. on. Like it's called meta learning or something. Yeah, how to yeah. how to learn, um, you know. And the point that a point was made that you know the the neural net uh, methods, the, the 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 knowledge base just ex has been expanding exponentially, and like you're never going to understand it all. So Jeremy's recommendation is like get on Twitter, <laughs> learn from the experts. What are they putting out there? You can kind of get a like the best of like what you need to know out there, and also like specialize in stuff like just get really good at certain things. Um, you know, collaborate with others that maybe specialize in things that you're not specializing in. But um, it, it's kind of hard to be, a, a, you know, a true generalist and, and get get all of this stuff um, 
you know, to a point where you're probably going to be satisfied with it, specialize in certain techniques and go deep with it, I think was, was one of the recommendations there. Yeah, I agree with the sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Get eight hours of sleep. Yeah. Yes. And Jeremy works less than most people too, apparently. That was the other thing. He just, well, he works. I should, I should go back and listen to that. Yes. My life. Yes. <laughs> Work smarter, not harder or longer. Easier said than done, but uh, yeah. Well, we are following his advice about group learning, so. That is true. That is true. I And uh, um, I'm still relatively new to the, the book clubs, but uh, I, I'm, I've already um, learned a lot from you guys, so I appreciate it. We yeah. got a lot more material to cover in this book. And actually, I, I don't know, are we essentially done with the book in a week or two? Because I, I think the next next chapter was was ethics, if, if we're doing that one. But then are we moving beyond the book at that point or, or not? Because yeah. we're yeah, pretty close to part two. After ethics, we'll do stable diffusion. Yeah. 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 Aaron, I was also thinking about the stride stuff that you were discussing earlier. Uh, I don't know if it helps, but uh, stride two kind of, I mean, in an image kind of context, uh, mm -hmm. there is a regularity in terms of what you're looking for in an image. So I would think that having stride two is more useful than stride one to reduce overlap so to speak, because if you have uh, stride one, the parts of the image that have, I mean, as, as you move one column or one row, there is more overlap as you move, yeah. literally move uh, mm. that top part, right? So if you do stride two, you cover more ground in lesser time, but at the, you know, you, you, you reduce the overlap. Uh, yeah but you have to have some sort of regularity in the in what you're trying to look for in yeah. that image. Right? Yeah, that that makes sense. It's it's kind of yeah. like the it's a it's a moving average is really what it is, right? And I think yeah. about time series trends, right? When you it's it's kind of like, well, where are you extracting the most signal? Um yeah. you, you go with like a 3 month rolling average or a 6 month or 12 month, etc. um you're right. It, it is. It's kind of similar to that, and and maybe, yeah, the stride length one in some cases you're just you're, you're it, it the the information's so redundant that you're not picking up enough uh, exactly. signal there. Yeah, and the pixel. I, I I guess in our con in the context of images, the images are of a particular size usually, right? Like it's it's hard to think about yeah. asymptotic. Like what what are what 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 would asymptotic theory looks look like here? Like uh, as the pixel size grow in dimension, or is it is it does it make sense to just accept that we have pixels of oh, sorry images that have fixed size, and then do the best you could internally, like you uh you increase the uh stride length if if you wish instead, right? The... Yeah, that's another good point. I mean, I guess if your image size were like much bigger, you you might have have a different opinion about your stride length. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I think you know what you read out there is folks are not using huge image sizes, and and most of that is just kind of a memory and a training issue, right? Like if you have yeah. too many pixels there, you're just you're going to train forever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that. that... 28 yeah. by 28 seems like kind of normal. I'm sure that's not the only, you know, mm. set of dimensions that are out there, but they tend to be pretty, pretty small overall from, yeah. from what I've seen. Yeah. I, I guess it also has an effect on the parameter, on the parameter count. Uh, oh yeah. You, you could trace everything like what, what would be a good stride number, but, but I guess they settled on two seems, seems like they settled on two, which <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't fully figured out how, you know, in a typical neural net model, you have hundreds of thousands of parameters, yet you're still not overfitting. Um, right. So I come from traditional like regression modeling and <laughs> it still blows my mind that that's possible, right? Um, 
Although, you know, there, it is a high dimensionality problem if you think about it with, with each of these individual images. Um, but still, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not over that, that you are fitting so many, so many parameters here. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for All that right. there, Aaron. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah. Good discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. That was really great. Thank yeah. you. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah. yeah see ya. <laughs>